Hi, this is Sharon Colvin. I'm the Youth Services Consultant for the Vermont Department of Libraries. And this is a recording of Sharon's favorite books on the 2016-17 Dorothy Canfield Fisher Book Award list. Now, <clears throat> there are eight of us on the committee. I am just one of eight voices, and I happen to like to talk a lot, so I'm going to give you my in-depth perspective on my um, top like 13 books on the list, lists that um, books that I think you should not be without. Um, of course, everyone has different opinions, and if you saw um, some of the presentations at the um, Dynamic Landscape Conference or at the Canfield Fisher Conference, um, you'll know that we um, we really fight tooth and nail for these books. Um, so at first, I want to show you a couple of um, resources. This is, of course, the Canfield Fisher Book Award page. Um, it's pretty easy to find. Um, here's the breadcrumb link here. You want to go to Book Awards and then um, Dorothy Canfield Fisher. So here you can find the master list, which is all 30 books that are on the sleep in um, consideration for this year. Um, I think also um, there are, if there aren't handouts, there should be handouts. Um, let's see, there we go, the B list. Right here, if you go to the B list, this is basically the honor list for um, the Canfield Fisher Award for this year. These are books that didn't quite make, um, make it to the end. And basically what they did, um, Hannah, the chair, and some of the other members put together, they actually went through how we chose these books. So this is the order in which we chose these books. And of course, the ones in bold are the ones that made it. And the ones that are not bold, those are the ones that were rejected. Um, and they did a really nice presentation about um, how those books um, like why those books didn't didn't make it. Um, so it's a very, very long process. And if you're interested in learning more, definitely contact me or Hannah Peacock. Um, but take a look at some of these that aren't in bold, because these are the ones that we get we gave really hard consideration to because they were almost on the list. All right, now let's talk about what I think. Um, so I'm going to talk about my top um, like 13, I think, books. Um, the ones that I think are just really stand out fabulous. Um, now, in order to um, do be on this committee, I read several hundred books, um, and everyone has their uh, their favorite kind of um, genres and, and formats. But and I'm no different. So let me um, I'll talk to you a little bit about that as I go along. So the first one I'm going to talk about, and these um, if you use um, library thing. It puts it, I sorted it according to this tag here, DCF 16, um, and then I sorted it according to rating. Um, so beyond that, I don't know what order this is in. So it's a little random. Um, all right, Full Cicada Moon by Marilyn Hilton. This book is in verse, which I have to admit is not my favorite um, presentation of a book, um, but I this is one of the last books I read for consideration and I adored it. It was so good. It was almost addictive and it's a quick read. Um, and I think it's an important book. Um, it's a good conversation piece. I think especially for kids in Vermont and especially in this political climate, um, I think this is really important. So this takes place in 1969, which is a time period. I think a lot of kids aren't really comfortable with. They're not so familiar with. So you might need to, to do some, um, contextualization for them there. But um, this little girl is half black and half Japanese. So first stop and think about that. Um, somebody who's half black and half Japanese has to deal with a lot of things. And um, she is moving from California to Vermont. And now think about that, you know, Vermont is what 95% white, um, and moving to uh, Vermont, especially in the 60s. Um, when racial tensions were still very high, even in the most liberal parts of the country, this was hard stuff. And so this this girl is she's just she's one of those kick ass girls that I adore. Um, she's very feisty and she just doesn't know what to make of this rural Vermont setting that she's in. But her father is a professor, uh, presumably at UVM. We're not really sure. Um, and he is a scientist and um, that's why they moved here. And so she's having some trouble um, with 
um, the, the kind of racial bullying that's happening in school. Um, and she makes friends with the neighbor kid. And um, one of the things that I think is really interesting is that she is really um, fighting against the idea of you know what it means to be a girl as well as all these other kind of fronts she's fighting on um, because she wants to take shop. She really wants to take shop and she doesn't want to take home ec. And so she kind of rallies her um, classmates to allow girls into the shop class, which I just think is fantastic. Um, let's see, School Library Journal recommends it for four to eight. I definitely think that's true. Um, it may not appeal to fourth grade, um, but I think um, there's definitely it's, there's nothing in it that's inappropriate. Um, and I think middle school kids would absolutely adore it. There's some really great characters in this book. Her parents are fabulous. Um, and it takes place in Vermont. And it's it's Vermont from the perspective of an outsider, which I think is valuable. Um, so wonderful book. I think that it's an important discussion piece. I think it would make a really good discussion book for book groups um, or for after school clubs, whatever um, you're working on. So definitely. Um, check that one out. The second one on my list here is my favorite book on the list. Um, it's, you know, choosing favorite books is, you know, like choosing favorite children, um, but I'm completely biased. This is my favorite book on the list. I just, just have to say, this book is phenomenal. It's one of those magical books that um, can appeal to a fourth grader, a middle school kid, high school, all the way up to adult. Um, there's really something in it for everyone. It's truly universal. And I think that's rare in a book. And I think that it's really important to embrace these kinds of books because I know a lot of you out there have intergenerational book clubs um, or are looking for, you know, town reads or certain people are looking for statewide reads. And I think this is a perfect candidate for it. Um, so this story is about um, a young boy named Teo. He lives in Baltimore, but his family is from Oaxaca in Mexico. And he goes to Oaxaca every, every summer to see his grandfather. And he lives in a place called the Hill of Dust, which I, I just love. And um, it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. And he hangs out with the old people who tell fantastic stories and he loves it and um, his grandfather tells him these tall tales and, you know he's never sure what part is real and what part isn't um, but he um, he listens and is, is fascinated and really adores his grandfather and one day his his this summer his grandfather pulls him aside and says um, I need your help I need your help to track down an old friend and so he hears the story of the Lightning Queen, and the Lightning Queen um, was the Gypsy Queen of Lightning. There was a group of Romani people who came to the village in Oaxaca and showed them movies, and um, you know were really. Uh, exciting part of their culture. So you had a lot of racial tensions in um, Mexico in the 1950s. And I think I didn't even know about all of this. And my family's from Mexico. And so I think kids are really going to be fascinated by this. So um, there's you have the Mixteca people um, who are from um, the Mixteca Indians. They're the Native, the Native Americans um, who um, are kind of outcasts in the society. Because then you have the quote, true Mexicans, um, who are probably um, a lot of Spanish, European dis descent. Um, and there's, so there's some struggle there, um, especially between the language that, that they speak. And then you have the Romani people um, who speak another different language. And they are, as you know, from history, outcasts everywhere in the world. Um, and it's so different in Mexico. So you have this kind of interesting interplay of different groups. And of course, the Mixteca people um, are outcasts and the Romani people are also outcasts. So um, it kind of makes sense that they would um, kind of uh, fit together and have a lot of commonalities. Um, so anyway, the, the Queen of Lightning is a uh, fortune teller and, or her mom's a fortune teller and she is, um, you know, they do a show and um, the grandfather basically falls in love with her and then he loses track of her. And so um, Teo goes on this mission to do research to try to find this Queen of Lightning. Her name is Esma, short for Esmeralda. And so he, of course, uses the Internet because he's a savvy teenager and um, he tracks down um, 
the Queen of Lightning. And um, so I think, you know, there's a little bit of a romance here that I think adults will really, really love. I absolutely loved it. I was in tears at the end of the book. Um, but there's also just a lot to this book. Um, the grandfather is an awesome character, quirky and hysterical. He uh, rescues um, kind of quirky animals that follow him around. Um, he has a three-legged skunk and a blind goat. And <laughs> he just keeps adding to this clan of like kind of just riffraff of animals that follow him around. Um, and he flies to the United States at one point and he rescues a bird in the airport and a turtle on the road. Like this is just how he is. And I just adore this character. Um, I mean, part of it is probably because he reminds me of my grandfather, but, and I'm a sucker for grandparents stories. Anyone who's on Red Clover with me knows that. So um, there you go. This is a fantastic story. It's wonderful in audio if you can get it. Um, and it's just a really good story to share. Um, I think it would be a great family read. Really, really good stuff. All right, Stella by Starlight. Sharon Draper, I mean, you can't get much better than her, right? Um, we had a couple of civil rights um, books on this list this year, and this is one of them. Um, and I really adore this book. Um, even the cover, and it's so rare that I love covers, but this cover is really fantastic. Um, this is kind of a um, an innocent look at the segregated South. Um, and it's interesting because it takes place in North Carolina, which um, I think we Northerners tend to think of as um, you know, part of the North, but really it's not. And so in North Carolina, um, during this time, there was a lot of segregation and um, a lot of, of strife between um, the white people and the black people. They weren't slaves anymore. Um, it was the depression. So, you know, tensions are high. Um, and supposedly, uh, black people were allowed to vote, but they had to go through a lot of hoops and um, it was it was very, very difficult. So Stella um, is an adorable girl, you know, she's kind of a kick-ass kid, just like um, the one in the first book, and she is struggling in school, and so she starts doing her homework by starlight and um, really working on her, her schoolwork and trying to get things, get learned as fast as she can, and as she's sitting on the back stoop one night and trying to study, she sees um, a fire and she notices the clan is in town and she, the innocence with which it's presented is kind of heartbreaking because she sees these men in white, white sheets on horses and she recognizes one of the horses. She recognizes one of the men's shoes. Um, and she starts to realize that the people who are under these sheets are people she knows and people she thought you know, liked her and loved her. And so she really, really struggles with this. And so her parents get very worried and, you know, start um, bringing her inside, of course, because they're worried about her safety. At one point, her father tries to go vote or actually does go vote and they make this huge deal out of it. And I love it. Um, they, you know, get dressed up and they all go together um, and they go to try to vote and they have to take a test and, you know, they don't make the white people take the test. Only the black people have to take this awful test. And she watches this kind of in this wide eyed innocence. Um, and I think it will really bring home um, what it was like in the 30s and 40s for um, people of color in this country. Um, this this racism was institutionalized and really, really horrible. So there's a lot of community in this book. It's a lot about, you know, um, the certain kids go to certain schools and certain kids go to other schools and why. And, um, and then kids struggling with who their parents are and do their parents um, reflect who they are and what does that mean? And um, then, of course, the clan is just scary. So in the end, there is there's a big fire, which might be scary for some kids. Um, and, you know, the community tries to come out and help. No one dies and no one gets hurt, which is, is great, but it's still a little bit frightening. Um, let's see. School Library Journal puts it at four to eight. Yeah, I, I would say that. The clan is a little frightening for a fourth grader, so um, use your judgment. Um, 
And, but you know, they may not understand what it is. You may have to provide some context here. Um, you know, depression era books on do not usually talk about issues like this, I think, um, at least not at this age range. Um, so yeah, excellent book, highly recommend it. All right, here is our second civil rights book, Night on Fire. Um, and this is another one that takes place in the 60s. Um, this one, this one has another fabulous color cover. So this takes place, um, I think it's 63, is that one? 61. Um, during the time of the Freedom Riders, and Billy is a, a girl who lives in Alabama, and she's hearing about these things like the Freedom Riders and Martin Luther King Jr., and um, but it's kind of distant to her. She's very sheltered, very innocent. Um, her housekeeper is black, but she doesn't really think about it. You know, she doesn't think about where, why doesn't she live in our neighborhood? It doesn't really occur to her until she starts really, you know, looking into these in instances. And uh, one of the um, protests comes to her town. The Freedom Riders comes to her, they come to her town and um, some really horrible things happen and the bus gets turned over and people are hurt. And one of the things that she is most affected by is the fact that people that she love just stand by and watch. They don't help. And she's really troubled by this. And of course, you know, the reader, you are too. Um, you know, are you as guilty if you just stand there and watch? And um, what does that mean? And what does that mean about her if people she loves um, are hurting other people. So she starts to ask some questions. And I think um, her journey is going to really, I think, appeal to kids because they can kind of take this journey with her. Because I think in Vermont, too, you know, there is a lot of um, isolation and not really understanding, you know, why is race a problem? Um, it's not a problem here. Well, it is. It's just people don't consider it. And so um, I think that this uh, this kind of approach from this place of innocence is really, really wonderful. Um, so Billy befriends the daughter of her housekeeper, um, who of course is African American and lives in a different part of town. And you know, she wants to be friends with her and doesn't really understand why um, you know, she's not welcome in that part of town. And um then, you know, why Lavender, um, who's her, her housekeeper, why she isn't allowed to do the same thing she is. And, you know, there's still a lot of segregation with buses and uh, water fountains and restaurants and even waiting areas. Um, and she's really, really confused by it and is coming at it by this kind of place of ignorance and innocence, um, which annoys some people, but I think for the reader is kind of Kind of sweet and, and and it's an interesting approach. So anyway, they um, they decide to go on a bus to go meet the Freedom Riders, and um, the bus situation is very interesting because of course she's with a black girl who can't sit the same place she can, and um, there's just a lot of wow, okay, um, and so they end up at the church at the end of the freedom ride and they meet all kinds of people and they end up with this kind of bird's eye view of this rally and there's a cameo appearance of Martin Luther King, um, Martin Luther King Jr. and um, a lot of really wonderful, wonderful discussion. Um, so I think this is a great kind of introduction to civil rights for kids. Um, if it, coming from this place of innocence, I think is a really great way to get kids talking about these issues that they might not have thought about before. So highly recommend that one too. Um, Escape from Baxter's Barn. Now this one is different. Um, this is a younger book. And when I saw the reviews that um, there people were comparing it to Charlotte's Web, I thought, ugh, whatever. No, Rebecca Bond is amazing. She has a book on the Red Clover list this year as well, um, Out of the Woods. And she's, wow, talented. So she wrote and illustrated this book. The illustrations are adorable. Let me see if there's any, um, here's the back cover, but there's just these pen and ink um, con um, illustrations that are just beautiful throughout the book. Um, and it's short. 
Um, it's I'd recommend it for young. Yeah, they're saying two to five, definitely. And this is about a family of barn animals. And you know the question of you know would a farm actually have you know just one cow and one pig and one goat? Um, and would they all live in the same barn? Yeah, I'm I'm not sure. I'm a city girl. But on the other hand, it makes for one of the wonderful stories. So you have all these animals with these fantastic names, and um, then you have Baxter, who is um, the, is it, no, it's Burdock, I'm sorry, Burdock is the cat. He's a one-eyed cat, he's a feisty barn cat, and he's the only one who's able to get in and out of the barn on his own, because he can fit through the slats in the door. Um, the other animals can't get in and out because there's a lock on the door, like a latch that the farmer puts down every night. And um, so they spend a lot of time together and they talk. And one night, Burdock hears the farmer talk about how he's going to burn down the far the barn and he becomes very worried and so he comes back to the barn and he talks to his friends and they hatch a plan to try to escape from the barn and it is hysterical it's heartwarming it'll make you laugh and cry and it's just absolutely amazing um you have all these animals with such wonderful personalities, and I think the kids are just going to love it. Great read aloud, absolutely, um, or just a great story for your younger set. Um, it's just fantastic. You need to own this book. All right, next one, A Night Divided. This is a very different book. Um, it's but it's about historical fiction and it's um, a part of history we don't talk about much in uh, literature and that is uh, the Berlin Wall. Um, so this is about a girl who lives in um, in Germany in Berlin. What when the Berlin Wall is built and she is twelve and her father has gone um, to the West Side and. Um, I think he's gone there for business or um, something and he the wall goes up while he's gone and so the family is completely separated so her father and her brother are on one side and and she and her mother and I think she has another sibling um, are on the other and they're just completely divided now the thing about this book that's really interesting is that it is not written like a typical historical fiction book it is written like a thriller it is like heart pounding oh my gosh are they gonna survive are they gonna get caught I don't know what am I gonna do I can't put it down kind of book um, I think that most kids are gonna forget that it's historical fiction and just think of it as an action book which I think is going to help you when you're <laughs> recommending books to kids um, so it is definitely based on true events um, but you know they take some liberties with some stuff she's you know trying to dig under the wall and and get to her family and um, it's but it's really really wonderful and I think the kids are gonna love the action-packed um, nature of this book and they'll learn a little bit about the Berlin Wall and, and why it was such a big deal and how it affected people um, so this is a really good one let's see uh, school library journal says grades five to eight yeah I would rec I would definitely agree with that um, it's definitely on the older side and um, kids who know a little bit about history um, might you know, have a little more context about it. But on the other hand, you could also give it to your adventure fans. It's all good. All right, moving right along. The thing about jellyfish. All right, I adore this book. This um, this book was one of the only books that I got calls and emails about um, saying this book has to be on the list. <laughs> and, you know, I, I feel a lot of calls um, about books and I always find it amusing when people say things like that. And this one was pretty consistent. It was, as you can see, National Book Award finalist. Um, it's an amazing story. So this story is about um, a girl, Susie, who we think has Asperger's, but it's never actually said or spelled out in the book. Um, but her social uh, limitations definitely point that direction. Um, and she is really struggling with grief. Um, so the this is taking place in the fall. The year before, she and her best friend had a falling out. 
And um, as girls do at that age, and you know, her um, best friend just was interested in other things and other people, and they had a spat, and um, they ended up fighting, and she said some really mean things. And then her best friend, um, whose name is escaping me at the second, you know, I'm terrible with names, Emily, maybe? Um, and you, Franny, that's what it was, Franny. Um, Franny goes on vacation with her family and she drowns and she dies. And Susie is trying to cope with both the grief of losing her best friend and the guilt of leaving things on bad terms. Um, and she just is not, is not able to understand it as none of us can understand any of these things. So um, she retreats into silence. She stops talking. And she really starts to focus on um, her belief that Franny couldn't have drowned. Franny was a great swimmer. Um, Franny couldn't have drowned. Something else must have happened. And so in order to make sense of things, she starts to research jellyfish. And she becomes so obsessed with them, she does a class project on them. And she starts learning about jellyfish of all kinds all over the world. And one of the ones she becomes obsessed with is the irukandji. Irukandji, I think it's called uh, jellyfish. It's deadly. And she is convinced that that this deadly jellyfish stung her best friend and that's how she died. And so she even gets as far as to um, buy a plane ticket and um, try to go to Australia to meet an expert to try to, um, you know, get evidence about this. And of course she doesn't go, don't worry. Um, but this kind of um, mission that she's on is really wonderful. Um, it's heartbreaking and the parents and the teachers in this book are really wonderful. Um, they don't know how to help her and, you know, in there not helping her, you know, she, they let allow her to do this exploration, which, you know, um, she kind of had to do in order to, to um, come to terms with the fact that she lost a really, really good friend. Um, so grief is a tough topic. Um, and there are a lot of books about grief, but this is a really, really good one. It reminds me a lot of Catherine Erskine's book, Mockingbird, um, which I also adored. So this is a really special book. Um, if you have kids who, um, you know, like reading about grief or who are dealing with grief, this could be a good book. Um, but also kids who maybe are struggling with some social, um, some social skills or some social issues um, or um, kids who are on the autism spectrum might also enjoy this story and, um, and relate to it a little bit. Um, School Library Journal puts it at four to seven. I would agree with that. Um, it's probably not going to be um, a huge um, attractor to your seventh and eighth graders. It's probably a little bit younger, um, but wonderful all around. All right, George. Now, if you've talked to me lately, you know I've been on a um, on a soapbox about George for a while. Um, here it is. This is a fantastic book. Um, this is an important book, and I really fought for this book to be on the list. Um, this book is a young book. It's recommended probably for, um, I would say, third to fifth grade. I'm saying four to six. So, yeah, you know, young. Um, and this is about a fourth grader. And this is about a fourth grader named George. George was born a boy. But George really feels like a girl, and she really feels like she was meant to be a girl and was born in the wrong body. Now, transgender issues are very, very hot in this country right now, and there are a lot of kids dealing with these kinds of um, identity and gender expression issues, and I think this is an important conversation. There is absolutely nothing sexual in this book. It's just about identity. Um, George has a fantastic best friend, um, Kelly, I think. Um, yeah, Kelly. And Kelly is like the best, best friend ever. Kelly, you know, George tells Kelly um, that he feels like a girl and Kelly's like, okay, let's go shopping. <laughs> I adore that. You know, it's part of the fantastic nature of children. Um, but the crux of this book is about Charlotte's Web. So um, George really wants to be in Charlotte's Web and the teacher's casting the play. And um, the problem is, is that George does not want to play a boy. George wants to be Charlotte. 
because George feels like a girl and wants to express this um, on the stage. And the teacher doesn't understand, and George is having trouble, you know, explaining this and hasn't really talked to um, her parents about it. And so Kelly and George hatch a plan to try to enable George to be Charlotte. Um, it is adorable. Just the plot is adorable. Um, but the whole idea of being who you are and struggling with this idea of are you a girl, are you a boy, does it really matter? Um, in the grand scheme of things, you know, it's just, it's really fantastic. But it's also about, you know, these hard conversations that sometimes we have to have with parents and teachers, um, whether it's about a name or an identity or some sort of slight that we feel. Um, it's really, really good. I think that every public library in the country should own this book. I know a lot of school librarians are struggling with it, um, but if you can con convince your administration, I think every elementary school should own this book, every middle school. Um, it's really gonna appeal more to those young kids. Um, it's probably not gonna appeal to anyone over the age of sixth grade. Um, once you hit 12, fourth graders really get boring. Um, but this is this is an important book. There are a lot of kids out there struggling with these issues. Um, and um, I think it's important that we have books out there to support that. All right, couple more. Echo. Echo is fantastic. There we go. These one word titles are hard to search. There we go. This is a very long book. I want to see how long it was. Um, 680 pages. <laughs> it is hefty but it's in three or four sections. Um, it is one of the best books I've ever read. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, and it's told in three different perspectives. And then in the end, um, there's a wrap up where you kind of um, meet these characters again um, in current, current day or close to current day. So this is about kind of a, um, mysterious prophecy um, about this guy named Otto who meets three sisters and um, there's this kind of promise prophecy where he has a harmonica and is told to give the harmonica and the harmonica would affect people and be passed down through the generations. So um, this is basically follows the harmonica through time and um, how it affects these different kids. So you have Friedrich, who's in Nazi Germany, um, Mike, who is um, an orphan in Pennsylvania, is the only thing he owns that's of value. And then you have Ivy in California. And I think, if I remember correctly, Ivy um, is, yeah, it's World War II. Um, and so, and I think, I think I could be wrong, but I, I think she might be Japanese during World War II. Um, I might, yeah, I might be wrong about that, but that's, it seems familiar. Uh, it's been a while since I read this. Um, so anyway, this harmonica affects each of their, um, their worlds differently, and they lose the harmonica at some point, um, each one of them, and it gets passed down to another person. Um, but this harmonica you know, kind of instills in them this love of music and it really affects their lives. And then at the end, they all come together on one stage. It is gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Um, I think I got a little turned off by the whole prophecy thing in the beginning, the forbidden forest, whatever. Um, but if, you know, you get past that part, it's just a story about kids and music and how it can really, um, it, how it can really help and bring life to some very desperate situations. Um, really, really gorgeous book. Um, totally amazing. All right, seventh most important thing. This book is gorgeous. Um, Shelley Parasol is amazing. Um, this is the story of a kid um, who is having a hard time and one day he takes up a brick and he throws it at the head of a homeless guy um, and so he ends up getting arrested and he ends up on probation and this guy is actually not actually homeless but he's a he call him the junk man because he's always around tr um, picking up trash and he shows up in court and he says that 
um, he doesn't want to press charges, but that if um, this kid could come and help him with a project, um, that could be his community service. And so um, this is about a teenager, Arthur, who's really struggling. He's having some family problems um, and he's really struggling with anger and uh, grief and abandonment issues. And he is working that out. And so this interaction with the junk man is something transformative. Now the junk man um, collects all these bizarre things and he gives them a list. He gives Arthur a list of the seven most important things, seven most important things. And um, there are things like light bulbs and um, pans and mirrors and light, um, just weird stuff. And Arthur thinks he's a kook and starts collecting things for him um, kind of half-heartedly. But eventually he starts to uh, interact with the junk man and he finds out that he's actually making this gorgeous um, piece of art with found objects. And um, it's absolutely beautiful. And the interesting thing about the story is it's based on um, something that Shelley Pearsall saw. And if you grab this book in the end, there's a little bit of an afterword um, and pictures of the real junk man that she um, based this on in his real uh, art installation, which is gorgeous and amazing. Um, and so she turned this into a story of um, basically redemption and transformation for this one kid. Um, and uh, it's, it's very beautiful. It is a little bit of a tearjerker, um, but it's it's a really, really good book. I think that your older kids will really enjoy it. They say four to seven. I mean, I think even older kids would really love it. Um, it's the whole idea of, you know, um, being that angry and then getting involved in a project and helping you work out your anger, I think is going to appeal to a lot of kids. All right, Lost in the Sun, Lisa Graff. I think she was on our list last year. Um, I think she was. Was she on the list? I don't remember. Oh, who knows? Um, yeah, absolutely, almost. She's um, phenomenal. She has um, a way of telling these really great, kind of redemption stories um, that, I don't know, the characters are just really, really wonderful. So this is a story about Trent, um, who had an accident um, in fifth grade where he accidentally um, hit a kid in the chest with a ball and the kid died. Um, and, you know, it was an accident. It wasn't his fault, but he blames himself. And so he isolates himself from everyone and doesn't, um, you know, he kind of pushes all his friends away and um, he doesn't talk to them and, and they stop reaching out. And so, you know, going into sixth grade, he is feeling more isolated, more lonely than ever, more depressed. And he just feels like everything is his fault. And middle school is bad enough without carrying that around. But she meet, he meets this girl who's this very mysterious kid who has this scar across her face. And she um, kind of helps him come to life. And she's mysterious and she has a scar, but she doesn't want to talk about it. She makes up these fantastical stories about why, um, you know, why she has it and she doesn't let it bog her down and they become really, really good friends and they, um, really connect over a tragedy and, um, she helps him come out of his, his shell and helps him understand that, you know, just because you get lost in the sun doesn't mean, um, that you're lost forever, which I think is a fantastic message. Um, so Lisa Graff is a very, very solid author. I highly recommend it. All right, two more. Roller Girl, which I've been raving about for about a year now. Um, Roller Girl is a graphic novel. I'm not a huge graphic novel fan, but Roller Girl is phenomenal. Anybody, um, if you have kids who like 
We're going to tell Meyer's books. Definitely. This is a great story. I feel like El Defo. This is a great story for them. This is, you know, the typical coming of age story about, um, you know, the 12 year old girl who has done everything with her best friend and they start growing apart. We've heard this story before. Um, but the twist on it is that um, the girls grow apart because this summer, um, her best friend decides to go to dance camp, but Astrid has fallen in love with roller derby. And so she decides to go to roller derby camp. And so they don't even spend the summer together, which is very, very hard. And so um, this girl, Astrid, is really exploring her own identity through the sport of roller derby, which I think doesn't get enough play in literature. And she, you know, roller derby is hard and it's physically demanding. And so she um, really pushes herself to the limits and, and um, um, tries to figure out how she can do this, even though she doesn't know how to roller skate. And um, it's really, really wonderful um, story. It's this, you know, that story of um, finding yourself and also that kind of bittersweetness of, of childhood where you have to leave some things behind. Um, it's a quick, quick read, gorgeous pictures, full color. Um, the kids are going to adore it. So if you don't already own it, you should definitely own that one. And the last one I'm going to talk about today is The War That Saved My Life. This is the first book I read um, that made the list. Um, this is a wonderful book. It's a um, historical fiction, um, and it's about a kid who... Um, I think it's it's during World War One. Oh no, that's gonna bother me. Um, yeah, it's got to be World World War Two. Um, yeah, World War Two. So she lives in London, and um, she's never left her house because she has um, a deformed leg, and I she her mother is one of the cruelest mothers in literature and she's ashamed of her. So she won't let her out of the house. And so she never leaves. And, um, so there is this movement and this has been in literature before where they, um, shipped kids out of London at some point um, because they were afraid of the Blitzkrieg, the German bombings. Um, and so they shipped a lot of children away and they um, send her brother Jamie away because Jamie is beloved and she kind of to she stows away and ties along and she starts a new life with her brother. Um, and she starts to do things um, that she didn't even know she could do because she'd been locked in her room and had not been allowed to um, interact with people her whole life, um, which is pretty incredible. So it is definitely an abuse, an abuse story, um, but it's also um, kind of a, it's this, this um, historical fiction story of um, what it's like during wartime and moving to a new place um, and then starting over. And um, it's kind of like that, you know, classic um, rags to riches adoption story where suddenly she um, she gets to start, o start over with a new family, um, which is really wonderful. It is definitely hard in parts, especially um, the abuse. I think it's harder for us as adults and caretakers than it is for the kids. Um, School Library Journal is recommending it from four to six. I definitely think that's true. It could go a little older even. Um, and it's just really, really wonderful. And if you have kids who are interested in World War II, this could be um, interesting. Kids who like stories um, about, you know, the triumph, overcoming adversity, this could be a great book as well. All right. Um, you're welcome to look at the rest of my list if you want. You can see the other books and how I rated them. Um, there's a lot of really wonderful books on this list. Um, some I liked better than others, but that's just kind of how it goes, right? Um, I did want to point out a couple of resources for you. Um, on our website. Now, my assistant, Jennifer Johnson, is um, redesigning the website, so things might move around a little bit, but hopefully it'll get better for you. Um, right here, you can get to the discussion sets um, that are available for um, the 
Kenful Fisher Award. We also have the same thing for GMBA, and it shows you how many copies of each book we have. Um, and these are all borrowable um, from the ILL department. Um, so if you give us a call and talk to ILL, they'd be happy to put these on reserve for you. And we have more coming in um, in the next couple of weeks. So I know I just ordered a bunch of copies of George um, and then a bunch of copies of Lightning Queen um, and uh, Princess X. So those will be coming in shortly. Um, so definitely put those on, on reserve. Um, so that's about all I have for you today. Um, I'll be making some short videos over the next couple of weeks as I wrap up my tenure here. Um, but you can always contact um, Jennifer and um, here's the, the contact information for Interlibrary Loan. And happy reading everybody.